Yeah, you can say this, what I'm about to say to folks, but until you experience it, it doesn't quite end right. Rebel Stratus okay. was from 130,000 feet, yeah. and he had to pass through the sonic, transonic experience, and they weren't sure if his legs and his arms were going to rip off. Matt and I are single-handedly shaping USC yeah. football coach. <laughs> <laughs> I think Coach Raleigh would love to hear that. <laughs> The thing that I get twisted about Marcus Aurelius is how many people he killed. <laughs> Did he kill people? Dude. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> There's only three things you can train as a human. You train your craft, you train your body, you train your mind. And world's best are not leaving any of those up to chance. Jesus feels it draws inside the 10. Sideline, he's across the 30 to the 40. He's able to fend off the defender and bring in the game's first touchdown. Yeah, so what is that podcast called? It's called like Momentum. Dr. Michael Gervais, thanks for coming on. Yeah. I appreciate it. What a cool setup you guys have. Yeah. Trying. You've done, I bet, a ton of shows, which I've seen, but none probably like this in yeah. a truck. So. <laughs> this, is this a food truck? It is a food truck. Repurposed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. It's yeah, perfect. Yeah. It's like we were saying before, we, we go on Skid Row and we partner with the university and we distribute all the surplus foods. So when we're not doing that during the day, we have fun and have some cool guests like you and just chop it up. Yeah. Some people talk about culture, right? And then uh, you walk into a place and you're like, oh, they have culture. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Matt and I are single-handedly shaping USC yeah. football coach. <laughs> I think Coach Raleigh would love to hear that. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate you coming um, on. Yeah. Really excited. Happy I've been following be you since the Elite 11 days. Like oh, yeah. Myself How playing about... quarterback. Yeah. Growing up, you know, the past decade, the TV show that yeah. you guys produced with Yogi and Trent and all those years. And um, I think those teachings, even if they were small clips, I think they really left uh, an impression on me. Oh, were, yeah, yeah. I even watched it too, and I'm not even oh, a quarterback, you? you know. But it's just iconic, you know. Yeah, they do a really nice job, like both on creating the camp for, you know, what they believe to be the top coming into as a recruiting class. So the camp is one level, and then the education, and then you know the experience that the kids have, and then on the other side, like the coaches, we love it. We look forward to it all year to be able to go to the to the finals and see each other and and share stories and insights and practices, but then the way they produce it, you know, it's, it's top level as well. Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. No, it's really good. I'm interested in kind of the makeup of, I mean, athletes, obviously in general, and you're, in my opinion, the top performance psychologist that exists, but quarterbacks in particular are interesting. Well, I, I missed what you said. Just say it again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. Um, I just think, you know, quarterbacking in particular is interesting because you spend a lot of your time you know, a lot of these guys, myself included, you start playing at the age of five and you're in a sense in a pedestal, you're in the leadership position. And then a lot of these guys get to school and then there's a lot of adversity You know, at a top program like here. There's several four and five stars and you don't play right away and that gets in people's minds. So is that an aspect that you try to um, dive into at, at the Elite 11 or just in your practice? Yeah, you can say this, what I'm about to say to folks, but until you experience it, it doesn't quite land right. And so the idea is, is this, that you've been one of the best in your neighborhood and then, or the best in your neighborhood. Then you were the best in your city. And then you notice that you were in the best in kind of the region. And then in high school, you were one of the best in the country. And so you've had this experience where when you walk into an event, people come and talk to you when you're walking on the field, like there's a lot of eyeballs on you. So you don't have to figure out awkwardness. You don't have to figure out the um, mechanisms to be able to go to somebody and sort out like, hey, I want to introduce myself because they're all coming to you. Mm -hmm. And there's another thing at play. So that's the social aspect. Mm -hmm. And then you have, I say you, but I'm not meaning just you too. Sure that this is you for anyone who's Athletes. highly talented at a young age is that there's a foreclosure of identity. And so the identity phase is like between 12 and 18. And what does that mean? It means you're trying to sort out, are you punk rock? Are you rock and roll? Are you jazz? Like, what, you know, country, what are, what, how, what, what is your vibe? Yeah. What is your identity? You know, and the way you figure it out is by having multiple tries at something. That's what the, 
one of the hallmarks of being a youth is. And then for young talent, there's a foreclosure. I am an athlete. Yeah. Mm. So then what happens if you take that social aspect that I was just talking about where all eyes are on you and it's all, it's usually very favorable. And then you take this identity thing that I am an athlete and then you are thrusted into a position where people are better than you, meaning university level and or the pro level and or, you know, world stage stuff that it quickly unravels and constricts at the same time. So it unravels, who am I? What am I doing? And oh my God, I, everything that I thought I was, I'm not. And so there's an unraveling and there's a constriction. So this is why the transition is really quite tricky for folks, you know, that don't come in and start. Sure. And so, and that's at every level. So, yeah. and it's, it's a lot of pressure, I bet. I mean, people learn that those type of lessons at a younger age with less pressure at a high school level or whatnot. And maybe for a lot of athletes, that's at a university level, which is nowadays, I mean, that's almost professional the way they're getting paid and how everything's being dealt with in college level. Yeah, it's a different pressure because you guys know pressure, but I mean, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's a different dimension to the pressure. And then the way we think about pressure is that you feel like you have to think or move faster than you might be capable of thinking or moving. Mm. So it's almost like there's boxing in feeling that takes place. Yeah. And that's the constriction thing that takes place. And so there's a whole set of mental skills and practices that we can all do to find that sense of freedom when um, at one time we felt that constriction or that pressure. Yeah. So. I'd love to get into those specific avenues that you might suggest for that kind of pressure that we were talking about or performance anxiety. I can remember my first start. So I grad transferred from Vanderbilt. Um, my first start a few years ago out there, I was, I was relatively anxious, but I felt ready to go. And I remember for some reason that just it struck me differently. My coach went up to me maybe 20 minutes before kickoff and he just stared at me around the eyes and said, you don't have to do anything different than you have done all practice. You've done all the work. You literally just have to show up. And I, I, it, was, it seems so trite and simple, but for some reason it really struck me in a different way. And I went out there and we had a really good game and we won. But And self-talk is another aspect, which I've heard you talk at length about as well, which is huge. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, so I'm just curious as to like the different strategies for guys who are going through that process of pressure and performance anxiety. Well, that first one, what a gift. Yeah. You know, like it, it works from this principle that everything you need is already inside you. And that's a first principle for me is that um, it's not like I, I'm not trying to learn and grow. I, I, like my life is fundamentally committed to learning and growing. But the idea is that I don't need something outside of me to make me whole. Right. And so working from the inside out is dramatically um, it's a radical act to take and harness and control your inner life. You know, and it's really not control, but it's harnessing your, your inner capabilities. And so that's essentially what he did. He's like, Hey, just do what you do. Yeah. And you can say it casually, right. But it's a first principle that everything you need is already inside you. You've practiced for this. Yeah. And I think that one of the next levels of that is that we don't need somebody outside of us to remind us that we're okay. Mm. But then we take a sense of responsibility within ourselves to know that we're okay. The thing outside of us that we're about to do doesn't define who we are. Right, success outcome, failure outcome, whatever it might be, that that external thing doesn't define the internal experience in our life. It's actually just more information, you know, to be able to to work with an experience. And then I'll I'll, I'll end on this: is that um, ultimately what this, what I've come to learn that life is really about at, at a fundamental level is that it's about how do you experience experiences. And I learned that from John Kabat-Zinn, who's a legend. I hope you can have the chance to meet some point. Um, but his writings are incredible. But what is your relationship with the experience that you're having? Mm. And if you, can, if, if you can invest in how you want to experience things, independent of like someone rolls their eyes at you or someone drops a ball or you, know, you skip one in the dirt, whatever it might be, that you know how you're going to deal with that experience in advance. Awesome. So you were talking about you know, the noise outside, not letting you, not letting it affect, you know, the play. Your experience. And, yeah, your experience. How does social media affect that? And I mean, from our perspective as players, you know, I think. It's in your face, 24-7. Yeah, I mean. I've seen teammates where it's affected them tremendously. We're right after the game, they're in the locker room, you know, Kevin Durant-esque, you know, <laughs> going through the mentions. <laughs> and even um, we had Drake London on here 
uh, our teammate last year, he just went 10th or 8th overall. He said he, he used to store, like, screenshot in some sort of folder, like, all the mean uh, and you know, disrespectful tweets or whatever and use that as motivation. So, I, I don't know. It's, I think it's an interesting thing to navigate that's relatively new. Yeah, relatively, yeah. Your generation is dealing with something different. And so the science around it is quite interesting. And it's not, there's not a clear path. And when I say a clear path, it's like, is it facilitating? Is it debilitating? We do know that there's a cost by, in, in at least twofold. One is the time cost of being able you know, to spend so much time checking what other people are thinking about. So there's a time cost there. And then there's a psychological cost, which is how much, it's called valiance, how much um, value do you give that external voice? And so if you, if you can find a way to use it to propel you forward, which is what you're suggesting, yeah, yeah I, I'm not so sure I'm a fan of like building off of negativity, you know? So, but, but each individual is different and they've got their own unique psychology. I'd rather build off um, something else that's more sustainable than needing people to talk a certain way about me. That being said, when I strip it down and, and I think about me, it's like when somebody says something um, that is counter to what I think I'm capable of, it, there is a little bit of fire that I can relate to. But fire, you want to make sure it doesn't burn out of control, that, that you know, it can keep you warm. So I, in general, like I'm not speaking out of both sides of my mouth, but you want to be very thoughtful and careful about attending to the external noise in any part of your life, certainly the critic. Sure. And so that might be a game for temporary high performance, you know, and, yeah. and temporary high, um, high motivation. But I'm not sure that's the, that's the bet I want to play in my life. I don't want to come from that Negative. severe agitation all the time. Where, what do you recommend to come up from? Uh, having a command of yourself. And so, so if I pin that idea and then and drill into it, it's that if you can figure out with great clarity what you believe is possible for you, and then you use your imagination in a way to, uh, one, our imagination is one of the most powerful mechanisms on the planet. No one else other than humans that we can at best understand has the power of imagination. And so I don't know how skilled you feel like you are at it, but using your mind to feel and see the future in an electric, wonderful way is a radical commitment to your potential. And so I start there, like, what can I see and what can I feel? And can I get really clear about that? And if that lights me up, then I build a plan accordingly. And then I talk to others about it, like, hey, what do you think? And there's a calibration about the plan, not the idea, but the plan. Interesting. And then so I, that's where we fold in wisdom councils and, you know, other people have been down the path. That's where we fold in science and best practices. That's where we fold in, you know, um, our knucklehead friends that, you know, might have something to say about a plan as well. <laughs> so, you know, but using your imagination to see the future, uh, that who you'd like to be, how you'd like to be, and maybe what you'd like to do, um, it doesn't mean if you see it, it'll happen. That, is, it, that's, is that something that's you have to train? Something you do, like, on a daily basis? You're like, okay, I have to imagine this is happening today, or is this, like, what I'm going to do in five years? How is that imagination split up from a time Yeah, it's not, con it's not concrete. It is, okay. there is a skill connected to it. So it's a really good question. Um, it's not concrete, like, what is the best practice to do it? I can tell you the skill okay. that sits underneath of it. We can get into that. Yeah. But the, the bigger idea is to use it. Okay. Like, to, to really spend the time, rather than checking what they think is cool, right? Big watch, big house, big car, that kind of BS stuff. And, and then checking, instead of checking there, but you, you go within, you use this powerful imagination that's already inside of you. You've already done it, and we all did it in the sandbox. You know, we had imaginary friends. We had like imaginary stories. Like sure. we told, when you tell a lie, there's an imagination in that. Like we're using it all the time, but to purposely think about your future, who you are working on becoming and get that really clear, like fabrically clear, like tinsel strength clear, like you know exactly what it is. Yeah. Um, that's a radical commitment to your future. And how do you go about that plan? So say you have something you want to do or you see yourself being able to do something. Now, what's the step in creating a plan? Okay, before we go there, let's talk about the skill, okay. the skill part of it. So when you use your imagination, um, you'll hear in sports science, visualize it. Mm -hmm. But that falls a little short, right? Visualization is just seeing it. 
And then imagery is about using all five of your senses to experience it. Okay. So you want to smell it. You want to hear it. You want to taste it. You want to feel it. The whole thing you want to come alive. And so you, you can build those skills in something that is non-electric. And then you can apply those skills to something that's really electric. Okay. What do I mean by electric? Super stimulating to you. You know, you're, okay. you kick an ass being you in the future. Okay. And that can be in an upcoming practice or a game or you way down the road. It could be the way you want to walk into a social event, the way you want to present an idea to, you know, a board, whatever it might be. Okay. So that's very concrete. And then what I'm suggesting, and that's electric, hopefully, but what, I, what I'm suggesting is to get really good at those sub capabilities. Mm -hmm. So you could do it around, I don't know, I mean, we're not gonna run through it right now, but if, if we close our eyes and, and try to imagine a fruit, mm -hmm. you know, like let's say an orange, right? And then can you see it? Can you, can you feel what it would feel like in your hand? Can you imagine what it would smell like? You know, could you manipulate it and move it around and see it from different directions? And then can you taste it? You probably know yeah. your saliva is already happening. Yeah. Right? yeah. So like all of that is like, that's non-electric, really basic. Okay. And then if you can get good at that, then you can apply it in the right way later to the, the things that have like electricity in the veins. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's the power of imagery. And I will tell you that world's best across multiple disciplines, like um, that is, that is common. Almost, I'll tell you one of the, um, he was dubbed as, one of the fastest men alive, um, obviously track and at the Olympic level. And, you know, he was very clear. He's like, Hey, listen, um, I think I have a problem. I go with imagery. He goes, yeah. He goes, uh, you know, I, I do my best imagery in the shower and, um, my wife thinks I have a masturbation problem. <laughs> you know, like, what are you doing in there, honey? Yeah. You know, like, why are you in there 15 yeah. minutes? What is going on in here? And, and the, the, the funny joke is like, listen, if I had a problem in there, it would be like 30 seconds. Like, I mean, <laughs> you know, so so um, I say all that because that was his place to get into. Mm -hmm. Most people don't understand, you know, what, what that type of commitment. And you guys do, though. This is the special thing that athletes have to offer the rest of the world is not the athletic prowess that you guys have committed to. It, it's impressive. It is the way you fundamentally orientate and design your life to get better. Mm -hmm. And so daily, what you guys do is that you push to the edges of your capability because you know at the edges is where growth. iteration happens, growth happens, yeah. innovation, like that's where it happens. So you've got people you trust and you have said, yes, I'm gonna go to the edge every day, emotionally, physically, technically fill in the blanks mentally, hopefully as well, where many people don't have that structure nor the commitment to do it. So you, you guys are the cool kids on campus. And if you can teach the next generation of leaders, both on campus and out of, out of campus in businesses, like what that fundamental commitment is about, that's why you guys get hired at a higher clip than non-athletes because they don't know exactly why, but somehow you have, these inner capabilities of being motivated, self-starter, figuring shit out, da 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 da, but it's the fundamental commitment that's the first principle. We uh, we have a standard, is what we call it here, um, and one of those like bullet points, kind of on the standard that Coach Lincoln has brought in, is train at the edge, and it's coming in every day, trying to push yourself to that limit because that's where growth happens, and that's where you leave your your talent that you were born with, so now where you're going to become. That's, I, I love it. Yeah. And then with that same kind of fire is train at the edge, also recover at the edge. Mm. So be, if you're going to work hard, it is, uh, it just makes no science. There's no sense in the science if you're not going to recover equally as hard. Well, it's a part of the work itself, which people don't realize because you can only gain from what you can recover. And it's an active process. Like the dudes who are in the training room nonstop, those are the guys who stay healthy and can play. And when you say training room, you're not talking about the weight room. You're talking about on yeah. the table, getting yeah, soft tissue, exactly. getting ice, ice, stem, heat. 100%. 100%. Yeah. So what most people don't know this, the if you were to break out percentage-wise, percentage of time on the field, percent of the time in the weight room. So that's the physical stuff, not the, not the mental stuff, but the physical part. Um, mapped up against the time for recovery, massage, soft tissue, all of that work. What is the What are the units in, units out that you... You're working from wow it would a vast majority would be the amount of time you spend that's not 
directly allotted to the time with a strength coach or like scheduled deployments with trainers would you agree like extra time away from them well i think he's isn't he are you talking about like the difference between how much you're actually doing sprints versus how much you're doing like recovery yeah that's right yeah i yeah. think i mean i think you're doing sprints whatever you're only can work out for so many hours in a day like two three hours i think the rest of my day is spent like Recovering. in the cold tub for 30 minutes that could be the entire workout the workout's only 45 minutes you know if you had an intense yeah. hit set or something you know yeah. uh, i think it's mostly recovery because like every can't run all day. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a exciting. full time job to recover. And most people yeah. don't know it. When you go into business, you guys will find this maybe at some point is that the, the, uh, lack of sophistication in recovery is, um, people are, are waving their arms saying, I'm not working like this anymore. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> we got a friend in here with this. Yeah, we got a fly. <laughs> a little fly. I'm not working this way anymore because I am so <laughs> under recovered that, you know, uh, so you're on it. You guys are definitely on it. Yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated by how confidence works. Um, and, uh, the imagination piece we were talking about, I'm interested in how potentially that's interrelated. Cause like me seeing myself throw a touchdown and then I go on the field and I feel like I've already done it before. And that may give me a, a larger sense of confidence, but I mean, I've just noticed in myself, I mean, I'm a different player when I'm doubting myself, when I'm thinking too much, thinking too much, I think, especially, I think, I mean, there's a common phrase, you know, if you think on the battlefield, you're dead kind of thing. And maybe there's something to just going out there and reacting. Uh, 1000%. So imagery is there's good science around the relationship between imagery and confidence because there's a familiarness to it. And, um, confidence though, is a mechanism that can be trained. It's not left up to chance. Like when I was a kid, you know, coach would say, go out there, be confident. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How? Easier yeah. said than done. Well, just go out there. You're okay. You're good. Yeah, okay. I feel good now, but like sometimes I don't know. <laughs> yeah. like, so how do I do it? And they're like, uh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So, so he, here's the net net of it is that many people. If I ask you guys, we'll, we'll just kind of play along here. If I ask you where confidence comes from, you might know the answer. But what do you think most people say? Themselves. Okay. Yeah. You, what, what What do you think? Well, I believe it comes from preparation. I'm trying to think of what most people would say. People would say it comes from other people. Does it or, come from experience? Yeah. I think a lot of people would also think it could be genetic. Some people are just born to be more confident than others. I th okay, so that is there's some of the thinking there. You said from others, from past performance, da da da. It only comes from one place, which is what you say to yourself. So that's the only place that confidence comes from is what do you, what are you saying to yourself about yourself, about, you know, this situation, what you're capable of. I'll give you the math on this in a second, but we call it self-talk, right? So confidence comes from one place and one place only, which is self-talk. And you say, well, hold on a minute. Like, I can't just say that I'm going to go walk into the gym and beat Michael Jordan. You know, let's go. Yeah. It, that self-talk has to be credible. You have to have earned the right to say something epic about yourself. So if you, if you don't earn it, it, it can't be true. Okay. So you, you can't fake yourself out that fake it till you make it shit. Yeah, that's wrong. Like, w do you want to buy a designer handbag? No. Do you want to buy a designer watch? No. You know, you want something authentic and real and true and handmade and crafted and it's, it's leathered and worn and it's going to stand up for the ages and it's beautiful. That comes from real hard work, yeah. but confidence doesn't come from the hard work because you can do all the hard work. You could walk up the th five stages to get in the UFC cage yeah. and go, oh God, look at this. Look at this specimen. I got to go try to fight. And then your confidence is whack. Yeah. And vice versa. Those who don't even put in the work are overconfident, which to me is fascinating. I don't, I don't understand yeah. how that works either. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like they're tapping into some genetic talent thing. Yeah. If they're yeah. a high performer, yeah. like yeah. they don't put yeah, in the yeah, work yeah. and they're like, I got this. Yeah, and it works for them. Yeah, it's well, crazy. To an extent, probably. For a while. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and like, we all think we're big until we w see a gorilla. Yeah. yeah. You know, like the biggest human is not bigger than the human biggest gorilla. And you see an 800 pound gorilla, you're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay, that, that type of power is different. So, you know, it works for a while. You know, when talent can take over, the genetic coding can kind of carry somebody. Um, all that being said is you, confidence, the math on confidence is this appraisal, fancy word for like evaluation, right? You're evaluating what you believe the external conditions, the external demand to mm -hmm. be, 
mapped up against your internal skills. Mm. So, so that's the math underneath of it. Yeah. To get, but you, it's ultimately what you say to yourself. There's a little math involved, and you got to earn the right by doing Sick. hard things in your life to say, I can do hard things. And, and last thing, if you can say to yourself, like honestly say to yourself, yeah. I do hard things, period. And this thing looks hard. Yeah, I did it. <laughs> no, no, no. This thing I'm about to do looks oh. hard. Oh, okay. Yeah. But that's what I do. But that's what I do. I do oh, hard things. I like that. Yeah. Okay. That's who I am. No, yeah. No, not who I am. That's what I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, so yeah. I'm huge into mantras. I think that's super helpful. One thing um, I've just kind of gathered over the years um, is like when I'm about to do a rep or a set and I'm like kind of in it and I'm in pain or whatever's going through my head, I, I tell myself two things like, uh, one is that l life is hard and you can either pick it to be hard to win. It's hard to lose as well. I mean, when you're a loser, you, you're suffering because now you're like, dang, I'm losing. But it's also very hard to win because now you have to choose to do hard things. So I'm saying I'm going to make a choice. Why not choose the hard that gives me success? That's good. You know? yeah. And I think oh, of that yeah, in my head. Yeah, and I'm yeah, like, yeah. Oh, do I want to be great? Do I want to be great? And I just say it in my head, like right before the rep. And it really helps. I mean, I, I the amount of motivation I get from that and just saying it to myself a couple of times is Sanity. Yeah, I, I don't think it's the words. You know, I don't think it's the mantra. I think it's where it's coming from. Okay. Like, you really want that. Yeah. Right? Is, is that true? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what's up. Yeah. And then, you know, then the work there. So you're working hard, and you're understanding the relationship between your self-talk and the extra rep, mm -hmm. right? And then translate that into when you see something, not a, not a loaded barbell, but now, like, a loaded team, or yeah. whatever, like, or maybe an artistic project that you're working on, or like I said earlier, you're gonna go pitch, you know, your billion dollar idea to, you know, VC, whatever it is, like figuring out that internal dialogue and statement is, it's a separator for most people because they haven't invested in this capability. I listened to this interview with you and Tim Ferriss, mm. who I love, by the way, but you had this amazing Grand you, Canyon story. You, you added butt in there. <laughs> <laughs> Did I? Yeah. yeah. Oh. It was an amazing interview, but. <laughs> well, I didn't mean to say butt. But, uh, what we'll I was cut it out, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. What I was trying to get to was this amazing um, Grand Canyon story that you had, where you kind of discovered the, the skill of being mindful and being where you are. Can you, can you tell that story? I don't think Matt's yeah, I, I thought I thought it was really powerful, actually. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. So... I haven't talked about this much. It was, um, it was a little backstory to the story. Okay. And so um, the event happened my freshman or sophomore year in college. But me getting to college was really windy. And so I grew up in action sports. I grew up, you know, off access, counterculture. Um, I didn't fit in stick and ball sports. I didn't understand these man-made rules, you know, these – uh, artificial rules and these adults screaming at kids like I, d I didn't fit in any of that growing up I was like whoa why are you raising your voice at me and yeah. like what'd you what, play um I tried soccer okay you know um and that's kind of where I've sorted what I'm saying out yeah and um my parents were incredibly laissez-faire I love my parents you know but laissez-faire parenting is like uh I know you're six but can you figure your way out home you know, like I grew, we grew up in like 20 acres in, in like it was, it was wild. Like 20 acres is a lot for yeah. a six year old kid. You yeah. Know? <laughs> maybe it wasn't six, maybe it was eight. And it's like, hey, be home by dinner. That's kind of cool. Yeah, we had no street lights. <laughs> yeah, you like that. Right? You like it till you're in it. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, it was, listen, it, 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 for a lot of reasons, it was epic. Yeah. You know, no street lights, dirt roads, no real neighbors, me in the wild. Um, and if it got dark and you're lost, it's really scary. Yeah, at eight years old. Yeah. So you had, I had to come up learning Mother Nature, the rules of Mother Nature, and kind of how to play um, in that sandbox. And then I go to like these, how big is a soccer field? Like, is it, oh, is it bigger it's than bigger. a football field? I think it's bigger, right? Like yeah. another extra like 10, 20 yards? It's definitely wider. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, it's it, roughly 120 yards. And I was like, what you, they're like, focus. And I was like, yeah, good. Oh, okay, oh, on what? Like yeah. the ball. And that focus on the ball, I'm doing my thing. And then I miss the, comp you know, a competitor rips it right off my feet. And they're like, well, you got to focus. I was like, I want I'm looking the at the ball. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and they're frustrated with me. And they're like, yeah. so it didn't make sense that like I couldn't step on the line yeah. or step over the line. Like what, what are these rules? Aren't we just trying to score? Uh, and so anyways, there's a long narrative to say that I didn't like rules um, that didn't make sense to me. And yeah. 
And then I found Mother Nature that taught, and I respected those rules because they're swift and harsh and real and, you know. Yeah. And so um, I, I struggled in high school mightily and um, I needed deep mentorship. And so I didn't, I, I, on my PSAT, did you guys take PSATs? The practice, yeah. 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 I got a zero. <laughs> How'd you get a zero? Yeah. SAT. I got a zero. I went surfing on both of them. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, you yeah. didn't show up? Yeah. I, didn't show, yeah. <laughs> so, I was like, I think you get points for yeah. writing your name. That's so. what they told me. Yeah. So, so there's two things in there. One was like this fear of like showing up and not having the goods. Mm. So I didn't have that internal mechanism, right? Sorted out. And, um, and, you know, it was really cool to be hardcore and just blow it off. And, you know, I had that narrative inside of me. So I ended up going to a, a community college and um, it was awesome. So it was the first or second year and I fell in love with learning. Once I got to that environment, I was like, oh my God, the psychology of things, the, 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 the world of the invisible is alive. It's beautiful. It's amazing. And I, no one ever had to ask me to read a book from that point forward. I, I think I read one book prior to that. Yeah. <laughs> and so I fell in love with it. This one professor, um, two professors actually, uh, they, they said, hey, listen, we're going to take uh, 11 of you guys uh, down into the Grand Canyon for this leadership camp. It's a silent, basically solo and silent retreat leadership experience. You in? I was like, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> I went down there. And, like, it, it flipped me upside down. Really? Like, it, it, it knocks so much calcium off. Um, and it really fundamentally reconnected some stuff that I was disconnected to. It was a mindfulness practice, a journaling practice. We had to self-sustain ourselves, you know, as a, like an 18-year-old kid or whatever, um, at, at the bottom of Mother Nature. And then we had to rip out of there early because the storm was coming. Oh, my God. And so it was like we had to get up. We tried. We pushed it, pushed it, pushed it. And then um, we're all spread out on the Grand Canyon. You couldn't see anybody, the other 11, the 12. And, um, and so it, it, it was my first introduction to mindfulness. And this was in... 90, uh, 91, 1991. So, yeah, awesome. Yeah. So you just go down there and you brought books. Is it no technology and a journal? You yeah. Said? yeah. So you just, just writing down two books that they provide us. One was the Tao Te Ching, which is the, um, the, the Taoist Bible. Okay. And it's written by Lao Tzu and there's 81 koans. There's 81 poems, if you okay. will. Um, and they're epic. Really? Yeah. And then the other book was like, it was called The Zen of Seeing. Okay. Was it? The Art of Seeing. I'll get the title and I'll share it with you. And, um, and so that was it in a journal. And like, go get to know yourself over the next seven days. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So are those like ancient philosophies? Yeah, both of them. Okay. One, the, the Tao Te Ching was, you know, it's like, like it's their Bible. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so, Lao Tzu, yeah, that's exactly it. But it's not written like, if, I don't know if you guys have a spiritual affiliation, but it's not written like what you would imagine. Yeah. It's just, it's 81 poems. And the reason it's 81 is because you flip that number around and it's uh, one infinity. Whoa. Yeah. So it's, and listen, this was written thousands of years ago. You sure. Know, like, That's crazy. Yeah. So 81 and eight and 18, those are kind of cool numbers. Yeah. So have you read Meditations by Marcus Aurelius? <laughs> I have. Yeah. That's one of my favorite books. I'm, I'm rereading it right now. Yeah, I cool. Just, I think the. What do you like about it? the perspective that Marcus has as the most powerful man on the planet and his humility, his, I mean, his, his, his perspective on death, on living to me is just, it's insane it, for, for someone in that position. And it, it also allows me to kind of consider how similar the thoughts and the issues and, and the circumstances of people over 2000 years ago are to us now. Yeah, cool. Like it, it, we really haven't changed that much, and it's amazing. Yeah, what, what I appreciate about him is that he wrote. Yeah. And it was deep. And, um, you know, he came from a place of, like, basically control what you can control. Actually, better yet, master what you can control. Mm. And so that he was a strong proponent of your one person uh, the person's responsibility to guide in, in their own life so from that perspective 100 yeah. percent. the thing that i get twisted about marcus aurelius is how many people he killed <laughs> did he kill people 
dude. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, check into that part of it. But it was well, it was almost was way like, worse than him. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but it, it's like putting our modern lens from a humanist standpoint on yeah. things that were happening in his era is not quite fair. Yeah. That being said, is um, yeah, that part of it is pretty brutal. It's bloody. Yeah, the control you can control standpoint to me, especially going through the back to back injuries, that's everything. Yes. That's I mean, that's the framework that I've that's allowed me to navigate this and really any adversity I think that you face because yeah. Matt also had an injury as well. I mean, it's well, what are you gonna do? You know, one day you're in the weight room, one day you're on the field, football, practice, whatever, and you hear a pop and again, th those are just external factors and there's nothing you could Changes do. Changes your it. life for six months. Yeah. Uh, a second, you know. Yeah. The way you respond to it is materially important. And so you'll learn just like your first impulses too. There, it wouldn't be uncommon for you or others to go, oh, I get a break. Or, oh my God, let's go. Or my future's done. Or like there's a whole host. And it doesn't mean that you have one. It probably means you have all of them. Yeah. If you really care, you know. And so figuring that out, like how to navigate all of those different types of thoughts and not being unidimensional in it yeah. and still taking the next step forward. Did you notice any of those complicated thoughts? Yeah. As you're yeah. saying, I'm like, yeah. Jesus, because as soon as I heard the pop in the Achilles, I knew exactly what happened. I knew what was going on. And my first thought was, well, I blamed myself, honestly, initially. I, I was like, wow, I'm an idiot because I shouldn't, it was bothering me and I shouldn't have pushed it as far. So that was like, I put all the blame on myself mm -hmm. and I really just internalized that. And I just, there was some real bad self-talk. It was like, you're an idiot. Like, why'd you do this? Like, you ruined your career kind of thing. And immediately after, I'm like, I'm done. That's like, it. I'm done. Like, I, yeah. I can't come back from this. And then you kind of go through that evolution of thought process as you were going through, okay, I can do this. And then you go through, I will do this. And then you go through, like, here's the plan. So, That's it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that whole, and all of those thoughts sound like, oh, that's, that's, that's hard. It's the emotions. Yeah. It's not necessarily the thoughts, right? It's the emotions that are connected to it. Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me was kind of putting it into perspective. Uh, believe, I believe in God, and I'm a Catholic, so um, when I tore my pec, I had to get surgery right before our spring ball. Um, and so for me, it was changing my perspective of, okay, my physical skills are going to be put at a halt right now. What? Why is God making me do this? What? There's this different avenue that I need to go and take and improve on other parts in my life, so that at the time I come back to my physical, um, I'll be good in those other other aspects, and then I'm ready to rock and roll with a full, well-rounded, uh, you know, experience. I don't know. Yeah, that that's how like, you know, the snowball gathers mass downhill. Is that you're like, okay, well, the physical parts down. Well, I'm going to learn how to be, you know, great at rehab. I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn imagery i'm going to learn da, 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 whatever the other things are that are necessary and you will see in the pros a lot of guys will the work on their off hand or their off leg or the work on like some vision training not visualization necessarily but like actual eye training they'll work on some eye hand reaction to, they, they start kind of filling it out in other so that you become more dimensional when you come back and it's certainly a great time to do some of this internal work the psychological work it's a great time for it I'd love to get into your work in Seattle with Coach Carroll and what your, your, your role in that organization has been and what Pete has done, especially from a culture standpoint. We've had some, some alumni on who've spoken to his interesting ways of, of leading. Uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, you know. When you say interesting, <laughs> yeah. what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> we had uh, this, uh, one of our former <laughs> strength coaches on um, – his name's Tupo. He was a, uh, who was he, a defense lineman? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and he just had these funny stories where Coach Carroll would, he would go on a, on a stand up on a piano shirtless and just start dancing. And um, there was this, this other method before every game. He would have the entire team go into <laughs> yeah. a room in a hotel, you know, maybe two hours before kickoff, before you head to the stadium. And he would just say, okay, no rules. You can do whatever you want. You need to exert all of your, you know, energy or, you know, whatever kind of stuff and, and just leave it all in that hotel room. And then once you hit the field, now it's all business. And so it ended up being some sort of, to quote him, Wolf of Wall Street culture, <laughs> 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 which, 
where you know dudes are throwing chairs against the wall and spraying you know drinks everywhere and you know shoving. I you know, cannot confirm or deny. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, who knows? Maybe it's hyperbole, maybe it's not. But the way he described it was, was interesting because I've never heard of anyone else do something similar. So it was uh, probably. So I, I was with the Seattle Seahawks for nine seasons, and um, it was great. You know, two Super Bowl experiences. We won one in dramatic fashion, and you know, and lost one in dramatic fashion. Yeah. <laughs> and so having uh, on on the the larger stage in football, the experience on both sides of the Super Bowl, getting there is really hard, you know, and he is, um, he's progressive. He's an, an avant-garde coach. He's got a philosophy and he's got a um, deep appreciation for psychology. And so when I first started in my career, so I graduated, you know, as a licensed psychologist, PhD, and I, I left and I did full circle. I didn't like or really know stick and ball sports. But my first job was in pro hockey. I never played. Again, a lot of rules, you know, yeah. like so I'm back into that world. And um, I didn't dig it. Well, so why I, did you get into it at all? What, what need, made you? I needed a job. Take that. Okay. <laughs> <I needed job. laughs> and it's a pros, yeah, you know, no. like it's cool in that respect. And so, um, yeah, I didn't like my experience in pro sport. And so I, I left to go into what I call pure environments. So environment's a consequence where if you make a mistake or your, your partner makes a mistake, it is costly, potentially costly. Not all mistakes are consequential, you know, in these environments, but like Red Bull Stratos and people doing things that have never been done before. Yeah, <clears throat> potentially fatal in those instances. Yeah. And so, and the reason I, I use that adjective of being pure, it's because um, there's, there's no bullshitting, you know, like if you don't get it right, fatal yeah you know and so you know football's rugged it's sometimes very hostile you know but for the most most of the time some people have very bad intentions and you know i did a i did an informal survey in the nfl um uh, informal assessment i should say and asked athletes and coaches across the league is football hostile or rugged is it i'm sorry is it violent uh that was the actually that was the key question is football violent and then uh, violent is defined as the intent to harm. And uh, the numbers were like 80, 20, somewhere in that range. I can't remember the exact thing that it's not violent. Hmm. Really? Yeah, I know. What, uh, did they explain why or what the it was? The intent to harm for most athletes is not there. Yeah. Would yeah, you I mean, agree? I don't think I'm like intentionally trying to hurt somebody else. You play running back, but yeah. more, maybe like a linebacker. It's, or it's more like the intent to my will is more important than your safety. So if that interferes, then you're going to have to cross that road. But it's not my initial intent to just hurt you. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So that's that, and so it's rugged. OK. Yeah. You know, and um, it's there's an imposing of physicality and mentality in it. But the intent for violence for for most is not there. You, you know what the, the, the 20% it was some, something a little bit less than that you know what position came back is like no no it's fine <laughs> it's quarterback no no yeah. no 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 I think yeah like no 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 yeah. no it was it was the uh, free safety oh <laughs> really? really intent to harm I don't wow. that oh, shit. yeah dude's yeah. coming over the middle <laughs> yeah right yeah. Wow, I could shot. see that yeah just trying to yeah so anyways back, back to Seattle is that um, so I did that uh, pure environment stuff, high consequence. And then I met Coach Carol, a mutual friend, put us together and, um, for dinner, and we just hit it off and shared philosophies, int similar interests. And uh, he said, hey, why don't you just come up and see what we're doing? It's like, if I think it's different. I came up and it was different. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I, I love that, uh, the time I spent there. But I haven't been there for two years now. Okay. You had something, Alex? Coming off of talking about the team sport, how do you cater or alter your plan of attack when you are working with either uh, a team athlete, an individualist like the Reds, uh, Red the Red Bull, or maybe even like an owner of a team or, or a manager like a Toto Wolf? You yeah. know, how do you how do you cater towards helping them, given where they are on the field under that giant umbrella of? Yeah, that's cool. Um, Toto Wolf is the you know, principal and, and part owner. Of one of the Formula One teams, the Mercedes. Uh, scary, dude. <laughs> Why is he scary? German, right? 
It's like if Bill Belichick were German. Yeah, it's like just really incredibly intense. intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> Check him out on the podcast, on the Finding Mastery podcast. Yeah. Like oh, you, you had get, him on? Yeah, you'll get a sense of it. Okay. Like he's, he's um, really smart too. Okay. You know, yeah. he's amazing. So the question is like, what's the difference between working with like the leader of teams? Well, also like if you're, if you're dealing with an athlete, what's the difference between like, you know, their entire result of their athletic competition is on them whether you have a team player where they have to rely on teammates or you have that that owner slash gm slash head that has to yeah cool so best way to kind of sum that up is that they need to think creatively and clearly and have a command of their state to be able to give put themselves in the best position to make the hard decisions right to be fully present to take in the information in an unbiased, clear way so that they can respond eloquently to whatever the unfolding situation is. So that's one level. The second level is um, helping them generate clarity on the culture that they want to have. And then from that clarity of the culture, what are the best practices to cascade that culture? So it's not just good words on walls, you know, but it's actually a practice, a set of psychological practices to build the desired culture. And so those are the two big dimensions that I'll spend time with them on. And, you know, the first one's not that different from an athletic standpoint. Because you work from the inside out so you can respond eloquently to the external demands. And then sometimes you, the external demands, you're imposing your will on it. And, you know, it's like, how do you think about, or do you want to be Muhammad Ali that stands over the dude, yeah. you know, when he's down? Or is it more like, you know, um, whatever unique approach you would have uh, once success happens and failure. So it's working from the inside out for, for to be calm, to be confident, to, to think clearly and creatively. You mentioned something with the Red Bull program. I'm wondering if those athletes and individuals who are attempting these feats that are potentially fatal, for instance, like the guy who jumped from the stratosphere, stratosphere yeah. you know, onto a net that, you know, they were saying, hey, you might, that might not work, you might die. It's 100,000. Well, there's two, two that you're, uh, two, there's two. Rebel Stratus okay. was from 130,000 feet, yeah. and he had to pass through the sonic, a transonic experience, and they weren't sure if his legs and his arms were going to rip off. So that's, that's so that's crazy. One. <laughs> yeah. Like unsure. they just might fall off. Yeah, sure. And then uh, the other one that you're describing was a gentleman, an athlete, jumped from 30,000 feet, where airliners travel. A lot lower. A lot lower, yeah. <laughs> without, yeah. without a parachute into a 16-story net that he built. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so so that's totally binary. You yeah, know, yeah, you, yeah. You hit the target or you don't. Basically, for lack of a better term, like, are these people wired differently? Because I've I've also watched Free Solo, Alex Honnold, and the way he describes his mindset is also interesting in that he doesn't see it as inherently disproportionately risky for him because of how skilled he is at that one act of rock climbing, for instance. That's right. So he goes, hey. For me, going on the 405 right now, I have a greater chance of dying than I do climbing El Cap in Yosemite. Felix was on, or I'm sorry, um, Alex was on the Finding Mastery podcast as well. That's the, so cool. We get into his psychology. Yeah. But the, um, the question is, are they built differently? I mean, yes and, right? Um, I, my experience is that all of the half percenters are a little different. Sure. You know, and... I don't see him or Felix or Luke, the gentleman that we're talking about from the previous projects, I don't see them that different than um, the greatest mathematicians, um, some of the great business leaders that, of our time, you know, some of the great um, physicists that are fully committed to their best and adding to the body of knowledge of their science or craft. And so Felix doing what he did, that was the next natural step. And so... Yes, it's consequential. Is it risky? Sometimes. You know, Alex says it's not risky because he has such a command yeah. of his um, skill. skill. You know, his technical skill, his mental skill, his physical skill, their deep command. There's still risk involved, sure. you know, because that's what it makes it exciting. Mm -hmm. And But it just, it's a risk that has fatal consequences. And those are pure environments because if you're not right, it, it's a problem. Yeah. And so if you're not right, you know, if you're, if you're like a seven out of ten right pre-football game, yeah. I'm not 
listen, I have a high respect for what you guys do, but you can hide a little bit. Oh, yeah. You know, you can give yourself a little time to kind of find a groove. You can get a couple throws under your belt or a couple good, you know, routes under your belt, and you're like, yeah, okay, okay, okay. I'm feeling it, yeah. Yeah, but, like, you can't do that in some of these consequences, so you have to have com- full command. And so Prior to starting the event, Yeah, right? that's right, yeah. Which is different than our sport. I mean, like, you, can get, like you were saying, you throw a f- couple of, like, incompletions at quarterback runs and you get a couple of rushes but then you break off in the second half for 200 yards or you throw for 300 um you don't have that time to adjust uh, yeah. for something yeah, like yeah, that yeah, yeah. how yeah. do you how do you go through that process with him to get him same like, okay it's the same you know there's nothing different the science is the science of psychology there's nothing different yeah but it's the commitment to refine the skills at one's high, true highest level so his imagery is on point his self-talk is on point his ability to be calm and to trust himself is on point you know, and his basically his framework that um, how he sees himself and how he thinks about life is clear. And for most people, those are not strong or clear. Besides building these skills, like you mentioned, are there any like neurochemical, like, you know, nootropics or things that, you know, people can do or take? We, we talked about sleep before, but have you gotten into any of that kind of stuff as well? Yeah. I, I mean, as a, student of human potential like there's some interesting things out there yeah and then what you want to consider is like if you've got a leaky a a bucket that has a big hole in it and you're gonna say well i'm just gonna think about maximizing you know the handle right well hold on you know it's like do the first work first yeah you know and so there are interesting nootropics like phosphatidylserine is one that you know is not quite readily available it's expensive but it's Whoa. it's starting to find its way into um, some over-the-counter stuff but it really makes a difference for enhanced focus it's like the world comes to 3d oh interesting. yeah so that there's some like the what's that movie limitless yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. i feel like you're describing limitless yeah. no, 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 this is bradley this cooper is a step down there's quite a few steps down <laughs> yeah no but there's there's some interesting stuff but you know it's like same with like let's say nutrition i mean if you don't have the basics right and then you're thinking about all the little kind of spices that you're gonna put it's like come on you know so yeah you're eating mcdonald's (laughs) it doesn't matter what you're gonna yeah throw on top of it spend a hundred dollars on nootropics but you're eating (laughs) mcdonald's yeah so this is though you're asking the right questions like how do i optimize nutrition how do i optimize psychology how do i optimize recovery how do i optimize you know um my structure for training? How do I optimize, you know, my love life? Yeah. You know, it's, th- so it's just having some ideas of what are the, what are best practices? Yeah. And that is why coach Carol and I built an online course is we wanted to memorialize it and say, this is how you train your mind to be your very best. And, and we pull back the curtain and show you all, all of those ways to do it. And what we found is that business leaders, we're more interested than athletic leaders. Super interesting. interesting. Why? So the business world just took off for us of people that are like, no, no, no. I, like, I'm not betting on my youth. Mm. I'm betting on me being great. I'm not betting on physical prowess yeah. that I was kind of gifted with, like, and I work hard at. Like, I want my mind to be great. Because in business, that's all we have, right? Yeah. Sure. Really, we've got, like, thinking clearly and creatively. And so, so the business world is just caught on fire. Um, about what are the best practices for people at scale in a business to deal with the anxiety and the pressures of everyday life. It reminds me of, have you seen the show Billions? Yeah. With the, the psychologist yeah, there. On yeah, that. Yeah. It's so cool. You, have yeah, you seen Billions? So. Yeah, so they have this woman and she, it's this you know billion dollar hedge fund or whatever and they have like all these issues and I guess there's some mental issues that goes with trading and confidence or whatever. Sure. And she just, like they go in for like a 30 minute session and she just like, clears them up and then <laughs> they go back to the table and crunch some numbers and make like five million dollars for the company or something. <laughs> yeah. it's a show or is it that's a great show okay but yeah. i think uh those firms are starting to have psychologists like on staff and that kind of 100 percent. yeah which yeah is really interesting. i mean there's only three things you can train as a human you can train your craft you can train your body and you can train your mind and world's best are not leaving any of those up to chance yeah. and so we don't have to either you know you can how do you do the training your mind thing? Yeah, you can go find someone like me and like sit down with them. But there are there's programs, there's trainings, there's books, there's there's lots of ways to Especially do it. Especially with the internet now, I mean. Yeah, there's there are a lot of modalities. Um, all that being said, no, nothing there is no substitute for a, 
a psychologist who's highly trained that understands the psychology of performance, you know, like, and I don't mean because I think people are performing in their everyday life, but they understand what excellence looks like and how to train it. There's no substitute for that. I think there's a stigma sometimes about people not wanting to work with a psychologist. What do you have to say about like athletes just growing up being nowadays? Like, I think it's becoming a lot more, um, per se, okay yeah. for people to do that. What? Who holds the stigma? Who do you think? Us, Probably, I guess. Yeah. 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 It's, 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 it's your leaders. It's the older, it's like not, it's not, it's not even the seniors at school. It's the coaches. Like they don't know how they grew up a certain way about it. So it's take, it's going to take you guys to change it mm. because the, you know, the old, the old generation are not cool enough. So their job is to create space for you to speak up for you to say what you need and want. You know, you're the cool kids. So you guys are the ones to change it, to say, Hey, listen, my mentals, Marshawn yeah. Lynch, right? Yeah. Right? My mentals <laughs> my matter. Chickens. <laughs> my chickens. Yeah. So my mentals matter. And, um, what, hey, what's this program going to do for it? Mm -hmm. you know, how do you guys go about, you know, training the mind here? And if, if they look at you like, well, what do you mean? Harden up. You go, oh, yeah. Okay, good. good. Go on with that now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm going to go somewhere else. So the cool kids, you guys are the ones that are going to change it. And that's what we see. Osaka's done it. And, and Michael Phelps has done it. Carrie Walsh Jennings has done it. Yeah. Like, there's, you guys are the ones. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Gervais. I know you have to get on a flight, but I appreciate your time. Oh, yeah. How can, um, you know, your website, your podcast, which is great. Uh, how can everyone reach you and find you and listen to you? Listen, I appreciate, I appreciate you guys. Casual, smart, you know, like you got a vibe here. Thank you. Uh, appreciate yeah, that. I appreciate you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really good. Um, yeah, so thank you for that. The, the uh, Finding Mastery is the podcast okay. um, on social. It's at Michael Gervais on all the different handles. Um, and then we've also got on Instagram at Finding Mastery as well. And so those are the best places to check it out. Um, you can find the course there. Uh, Coach Carol and I ended up writing a book a while back. You can find that. Um, but most importantly, you know, um, we love to hear from you on social. And awesome. soon TikTok, right? Yeah. <laughs> Coming really? soon. That's the next step. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, you got to get a team on there. It's going to yeah. blow up. Or, <laughs> yeah. You guys are going to have to uh, teach this old yeah. guy some tricks. Yeah. Well, Matt, well, he's a big TikTok guy. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> yeah, Matt's the biggest TikTok guy. <laughs> Very cool. Appreciate awesome. you guys. Yeah, thank cool. you. I appreciate cool. it. Thank you. That was, that was awesome. Good.